Hello, everybody. Josh Neighbors here, Locked On Big 12 Podcast. Joining us today is Stephen Simcox of Locked On Horn Frogs. We are previewing the TCU Horn Frogs football team for 2022. Transition, transition, transition. We'll break it all down next. You are Locked On Big 12, your daily podcast on the Big 12 Conference, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Once again, Josh Neighbors here, Locked On Big 12 Podcast. Joining us today is Stephen Simcox of Locked On Horn Frogs. Stephen, just you, just you and me today. Not, none, of, none of the other distractions. We're getting down to business. TCU football. Uh, how are you? And generally speaking, how are you feeling about uh, TCU football this year? I'm good, yeah. I feel like it's been a while since we've done done uh, this format. I enjoy our roundtables on a weekly basis, though. Um, yeah, I have a lot of excitement. I mean, I feel like we're still sort of in that phase where Sonny Dykes hasn't actually coached a game yet, so everything is fantastic. There's a lot of optimism around this team, and because the results have been mediocre the last few years, I, I feel like most fans are just hoping for a more entertaining season with some more wins, and I, I think that's very possible under uh, Coach Dykes in year one. So, you know, the thing for TCU is, I mean, they they have Gary Patterson for so long. I mean, he is the guy that took them, um, you know, from – I mean, how many different conferences during his tenure? What was it, three or four? It was, I mean, probably more than that. Four, yeah. I, I mean, technically four. The Big East was like a couple days before they jumped into the Big 12. But, yeah, it was, you know, Conference USA, Mountain West, Big East, Big 12. It was It was a journey. And, uh, and you know, talk about somebody, I mean, who shaped the identity of this team. I mean, they – and shaped – I mean, not just this team. Shaped the identity of a lot of modern defenses, right? Like, he was a – he was a pioneer truly uh, in – I mean, making defenses, putting athletes at different positions. And a lot of the stuff we see in three three fives. I mean, Gary really helped, you know, get that stuff. I mean, safeties who can do multiple things, right? Guys, safeties who are playing linebacker, safeties who can play, you know, towards line of scrimmage. I mean – he captained a lot of that. And that was, <clears throat> excuse me, TCU's identity for a long time. And I guess, you know, to revisit kind of the end there, like the reason why things weren't working at the end was TCU did not have an identity and the, and the defense became worse than the offense was. They did. Yeah. The last couple of years were really tough. I, I think Gary was so instrumental, you know, for so long, he slowed down all these electric spread offenses by having great athletes on defense, by recruiting guys that were oftentimes, um, some of the best offensive players, you know, on their high school team and turning them into great defensive players who could run sideline to sideline. And I, I ultimately feel like that was part of the issue is as the Big 12 changed, became more, um, you know, power run heavy, like attacking teams, the defensive line. TC really wasn't able to adjust. But, yeah, the offense was a mess. I, I mean, he hired Jerry Kill, and he also had Doug Meacham on staff calling plays, and that – class of philosophies never really seemed to work and then slowly the defense also started to fall off and you saw it really fall off a cliff last season but I mean you can't say enough about what he did he is TCU football and it's very strange that he's not coaching this year um it's one of the reasons why when he was let go or they sort of separated I think a lot of national people said like well how are they going to do better than Gary Patterson because even with the struggles that they had had there was this belief that I mean the the program really hadn't been much, you know, in the 10, 15 years before he got there. So um, it's going to be strange to not see him on the sidelines. Um, He's so synonymous with the brand. But the bottom line is there was really not much energy um, around the the team, around the program. I think the the guys there, whether this is right or wrong, had sort of tuned him and the rest of that coaching staff out. And so a change had to be made. And um, now we're walking into a new era, and there's a lot of excitement around the change itself, and we'll see if the results actually, um, you know, live up to the the breath of fresh air that Coach Dykes has brought so far. Yeah, a lot of that talk about that breath of fresh air, you know, it's it's going to be offensive centric. I mean, this is a team that's now going to change, you know, what they want. There, I mean, we touched on it. Their their identity last year, they didn't really have one, um, but the idea was to be defensive heavy. And obviously with Zach Evans, you know, there was a combination of running the football and play, playing defense. It didn't really work out. What is, I mean, what is the Sonny Dykes identity for those people who are not, I mean, a lot of big 12 fans are, but 
those who aren't synonymous who don't really know, uh, you know, don't really know what Sonny Dykes is all about. What is the new identity of TCU going to look like? And obviously it might not be fully in effect in year number one, but what's kind of the goal there with that? Yeah, I think, you know, he's going to bring a lot more creativity to the passing game. Um, Sonny's not a true air raid guy, uh, but his splits at SMU were sort of you know, 58% of the time they were passing the ball. Um, and I, I think Garrett Riley has some of, you know, his uh, his brother's intuition of we're going to run the ball when, when the defense gives us that look, but we also want to – be productive in all three levels of the passing game. And um, Sonny's done a really good job with quarterbacks throughout his career. You know, he scored points pretty much everywhere he's been. So I, I feel like that's really where you start. And um, Jeremiah Donati, the AD, made a point to say they wanted to have an offensive-minded head coach. Uh, he brought in Joe Gillespie as a defensive coordinator, who is a three-three-five um, schematic uh, type of guy. He came from Tulsa. And I think he gave SMU a lot of trouble the last couple of years, and that's one of the main reasons why, why he has the job. But – that's some of the on the field stuff. I mean, off the field, he's known as a player's coach. Um, he's, you know, younger by coaching terms. He's 52 years old. So he's, uh, I guess, a little more relatable to this generation. But I think he sort of understands the way college football is moving, players having more autonomy, having more power. And one thing he did really well at SMU was access the transfer portal. Um, now, I think it was easy for him to do that at SMU because a lot of times he was selling like, hey, whatever kid that didn't make it, whatever happened that didn't make it work at some Power 5 program for a, a young man from the Dallas-Fort Worth area, just come down here. You can play right away. You know, you can get some playing time immediately and we'll win some games. Um, I think that'll be a little bit of a harder sell, you know, at TCU, but we did see him in the offseason dip in the transfer portal a lot. So uh, I think those are some of the, the trademarks that, that he is trying to bring to the campus and a um, little bit in Fort Worth. So this is going to start, obviously, with the quarterback position, which we'll get to in one second. First, quick word from our sponsors. Today's show is brought to you by Built Bar. Go to built.com. Today it's built.com. They've got new cookie dough chunk puffs, only 160 calories, and they have a whopping 15 grams of protein in them. They're good. They're good for you. They're covered and 100% real chocolate, you can go to built.com today. It's built.com. Use the promo code LOCK15, L-O-C-K-E-D-1-5, LOCK15, for 15% off. Once again, promo code LOCK15 at built.com today. So this quarterback battle is going to – it's really persi- – I mean, you mentioned to me a week ago, it could be like four guys, but really it's two. It is Chandler Morris, who was the backup last year, but uh, Baylor game uh, of Baylor game fame, right, the one game where he really just went bananas and, and kind of – you know, lightning in a bottle, potentially lightning in a bottle. And then Max Duggan, who you and I have had numerous conversations about. Um, and the the big question to me is like, okay, what they want, what they want their offense to look like will obviously dictate this choice. The one knock against Max Duggan, you and I talked about it too, it, it, so much is the short and intermediate passing game for them is really just, it was not existent last year. Um, this was an offense that predominantly relied on explosive plays in both the run and passing game. Now, that's good, but if that's just what you're doing, I mean, it's not great. They were 11th in the country last year in offensive explosiveness. The problem was, you know, it, it was feast or famine for them, and uh, that obviously didn't work. It feels like SMU hit a lot of big plays, but there is, you know, th- there's a mixture of getting athletes in space and having those guys make the play. In addition to we are going downfield, right? It's not just, you know, we're going downfield a lot. Uh, it is we've got guys in space. They're really good athletes. They're the ones making the plays to make the explosive plays in addition to us, us also hitting the deep shot. Right. And, you know, the Max Duggan conundrum is is fascinating because he's got great arm talent. And you saw that, like, he can really throw the ball down the field but he had a lot of trouble with accuracy. I mean, he had trouble just connecting with wide receivers. Part of that is that they were doing a lot of low percentage throws, as you mentioned, like they were going deep often and there wasn't a big emphasis on the intermediate passing game or using the middle of the field. When he did try that, he wasn't super effective. So, you know, it, it's been a, a, a interesting off season because I thought going into it, I thought Chandler Morris was going to win this job. And I still think that as we sit here today, but the fact that it's been so even, at least publicly, that's what you know the coaching staff has, has said, 
it makes me wonder the closer we get to the year, if they defer to the guy with more experience. Because I mean, Max Duggan's coming in, he's been a three year starter. It's pretty rare in college football that you just bench that guy. And I know there's probably some locker room implications that come along with that. So maybe that's why they're sort of dragging this out. Um, I just find it there, there's two reasons why I, I'm still not totally sold on on Morris. One is that we're still trading reps, first team reps this late in the game. And also, I might be reading too much into this, but Sonny Dykes has said multiple times that a big component of this is how the team responds to the guy under center. And Max is tough and he's hard nosed and he does, you know, when he makes a big run or stays in a game after taking a big hit, that does seem to fire up the team. He seems to have a good relationship with the guys. So I don't know if that is making this a tough choice. Um, I still think when they take on Colorado, it's going to be Chandler Morris. He played in a similar offense at Highland Park. He's made for those quick kind of snap throws that they want to really live on to move the chains. Um, but, I mean, Sonny said at media days, he was like, oh, yeah, we want to make this decision a couple weeks before the season. And then when fall camp started, he was like, well, you know, it's it's actually like a four-man race and maybe even walk on Luke Party will have a shot here and – you know, we, we just want to take our time with this. So I'm not sure what's going on behind the scenes, but it, it seems like it's close enough that they can't make up their mind. And I think at this point that's a little concerning given that nobody is taking the reins with uh, with the job yet and run with it. Do you think if, if it is Chandler Morris, there is a chance that we still see Max Duggan in some pa- packages? I mean, I think there's a situation in which it's like he's such a good runner, you know, and, and – you can use him with – obviously, he's got some chemistry with Kendra Miller and, and Amari Di Mercado. I mean, those are guys that he's worked with before. Um, I'm always a, I'm always a guy that if you're going to do that, you need to throw some passes in there. And so, I mean, I yeah. think you can still have a package where it's like, look, we still have the deep shots. You know, Quentin Johnson, you know, off play action, we'll run some of them too. I mean, do you think if they do ch- they do pick Chandler, they're going to have a little mixture of Max in there? Do you think Max is going to get reps regardless? I would think so. I mean, if he wants to, like, if he stays on the roster throughout the season, I feel like one, they'll have some packages for him or some situations where he'll come in. And then number two, I mean, both these guys, like Chandler played two games. He got hurt in that Oklahoma State game. I, I think part of that, too, was that it was a blowout. Um, and Max has been known to have an injury history. So I feel like, you know, one reason they might be dragging this out as well is neither of these guys have shown that they're super durable. And the bottom line is there's a good chance you're probably going to have to play two quarterbacks as the season goes on. But to answer your original question, yeah, I think Max will have some situations where he'll be behind center. And then they got another QB named Sam Jackson, who is a sophomore, and he's a real dynamic runner as well. And apparently at practice today, they were uh, – we're recording this on Monday. They were running him out in some slot packages, some running back situations. So – I think they're trying to be creative and get these athletes on the field and have as many weapons as possible out there. So the guy's catching the ball. We talked about Quentin Johnson. He's one of my favorite receivers. I think the one benefit he could have this year is, you know, I think the one thing we all have questions about is, all right, what does he look like in the intermediate game? How is his route running, right? Can this guy run the tree? Can he do it all? Because physically, I mean, there's no doubt about Quentin Johnson. This guy is a Sunday player. Um they bring back Tay Barber as well. What else is the rest of the receiving core looking like uh, this year? But, I mean, that's that's a pretty good start, right? It's, it's a pretty good start to have those two guys. It is, man. I don't know if there's a a unit that I've talked about more that really hasn't – like the production on the field doesn't necessarily back it up, but there's a ton of reasons to be excited about them. You, you mentioned Quentin Johnston. Um, he's going to be the dude on the outside. They also have Darius Davis, Tay Barber in the slot. There's a – a walk-on named Gunnar Henderson who got a scholarship in this offseason. They've used him in the slot a lot. They're excited about what he can do. Um, on the outside, on the other side from Quentin, you have Quincy Brown, who came in from Mississippi State a couple of years ago. Um, Savion Williams is a junior, and he hasn't really seen the field a whole lot, but I, I think he'll get some reps as well. Uh, so, yeah, there's a lot of guys that I, I think are going to end up being forces – um, in this receiving core, as long as they can protect and allow them to run some some longer developing routes, there's a ton of options for whoever ends up being the QB. So about that offensive line, I mean, you know, I, I don't I don't think we thought it was a particularly good unit last year. They had some moments. I mean, they had they had some moments they they could run block at times. Yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, they opened some pretty big holes, and 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 Duggan and, and Evans could hit some of those occasionally. 
Uh, we're not creating pass protection all the time. Yeah. So how has this unit come along? Because it looks like they've got a lot of older guys around, but maybe not all the experience in the world up front. They do. Uh, they've talked a lot about how this offensive line group has improved, and I think as a whole – the media has kind of just said, okay, sounds great. I'll, I'll sort of believe it when I see it, but they are excited about the coaching staff, at least publicly, is excited about what they have. Um, not a ton of additions. So Steve Avila is kind of the guy that's been the anchor of this uh, O-line for a while, and he can play guard or center. I think he'll probably end up at center. Um, and then Wes Harris is another interior offensive lineman that's dealt with a lot of injuries. So he hasn't always been on the field, but when he has been there, he's got a mean streak. He's been really good for them. Alan Ali is a transfer from SMU, um, and he's played some guard and center interchangeably during camp. Um, and then Brandon Coleman at the tackle position is going to be kind of manning that that outside and trying to anchor that. So uh, the guys that have been there for a while, as you said, not a ton of starts necessarily, but um, I, I feel like if they can keep one unit together and be cohesive, that's going to be the biggest key. They've had so many injuries along – the front line the last few years, but um, I, I expect them to be better mainly because I think the play calling is going to put them in better situations. You know, they're not going to be asked to pass block for all these long developing routes down the field. There'll be more intermediate and quick throws and hopefully that'll open up um, some chances down the field and won't have guys teeing off on them as much as they have the last few seasons. And then in the running back room, you've got Amari DiMercato and Kendry Miller. I mean, obviously not the guys that, uh, Zach Evans, I will say this, like the Zach Evans situation actually did allow those guys to get some more run, which yeah. in some ways was, is positive. Cause you bring them in there and they've both got experience. I mean, those two last year combined, uh, Kendrick Miller and Amari Di Mercado for over a hundred and basically 180 rushes. And they combined for over a thousand yards, uh, and 11 touchdowns. So, I mean, like you're, mm-hmm. you know, you're bringing back essentially a thousand yard rusher in the aggregate. I mean, that, that's, yeah, you are. It is. And I mean, Kendra Miller has been essentially a starter, you know, the last few seasons because Zach has been kind of in and out of um, the lineup so much. But he's averaged seven yards to carry over his career. So I think he'll be ready to go. Um, Di Mercado is, is a great name to bring up. When he came back, he's taking advantage of another COVID year. And I thought, OK, well, like he's a solid guy. He's been in the program for a long time. Um, but he's gotten a lot of reps during camp. So apparently they like him a lot. And He's a good pass blocker. I think he's somebody who can give Miller a, a spell from time to time. And then another name I'll mention is Amani Bailey. He's a transfer from Louisiana. Um, had over 600 yards last year there. So they liked what he did in the spring. I haven't heard his name as much during the fall, but I, I feel like he'll get some opportunities. And then finally, uh, Corey Wren, transfer from Florida State. He was mainly a special teams guy there. And he's kind of interchangeable. I'm not sure if they're going to use him more at running back or wide receiver yet. But he's another explosive player that I feel like is going to get some touches in different ways this year. But I think overall, you know, the headline is going to be, yeah, how do you replace Zach Evans? Um, but I feel like the production they have coming back is actually pretty well suited to at least kind of match what he did on the field at times last year, even though he's a super talented guy. And I expect him to have a really good season at Old Miss. Uh, all right, let's talk about the defense. So they do get seven players back. Mm-hmm. They do get their best players back too. I mean, you, know, you get Travis Hodges Tomlinson back, who's a first team All Big Twelve player. And also, D Winters, I actually think is pretty good and, and could be a standout linebacker in a league where there's a couple good linebackers. He could be a standout guy uh, when there's a lot, not a lot of great depth in this league. But the numbers, Stephen, I mean, 116th in defensive efficiency, 128th in explosiveness, uh, explosive plays against. They were 124th in finishing drives. Uh, I mean, they were about as as bad as you can get. And um, EPA was expected points added two point a point two one expected points added per rush, which means basically for every time every five rushes a team had, they scored a point over a point mm-hmm. against TCU. Yeah. Uh, that that's a lot. That is a lot. Uh, and so this brings back the old conversation about hey, just because you're bringing guys back you know, just because they're experienced doesn't necessarily mean they're good. The answer is sometimes yes, sometimes no. Sometimes they're college kids and they're learning. But also the thing to throw in all this, they are learning a new system, correct? They're not going to keep it. This is not an Oklahoma State situation where, you know, we're bringing in a coordinator. We're going to keep all the same terminology in the entire defense. This is probably going to be a little bit of an overhaul, isn't it? 
It is, and I think the biggest question for me is the defensive line. I mean, you talked about the guys that have coming back. They did lose Oshawn Mathis and Kyrie Coleman, who were two of their better pass rushers. But, Josh, they don't really have – like, they they need a true nose guard now. And coming into the offseason, they didn't really have anybody that fit that body type. Now, Sonny Misi is going to take on that take on that role um, at nose tackle. It seems like he's a starter. And then they're bringing in a freshman named Dominic Williams who had a really good offseason camp. But that's a, I mean, that's a big ask. Get a guy that's never really played that position, and then a freshman behind him, um, who are going to try to plug holes and and take on double teams and not get pushed back and allow linebackers to flow and make plays. Um, Dylan Horton coming back at one of those end positions. You know, Landon Watson's a young guy who's um, was highly recruited. But if if they can't stand their ground with those three guys up front, then it's going to be a long year. Now. When you look beyond that, you know, you mentioned D Winters. Um, I think they're set up pretty well, linebacker. Uh, one name to mention there, he's not a starter right now, but Marcel Brooks is a, a former five star recruit who's played on off. Like they've kind of moved him around all over the place. It, it hasn't really clicked yet, but he's back at linebacker, which was his original position. Um, and then in the secondary, they've got a lot of experience Travis Hodges Tomlinson, Noah Daniels, Ken Stewart. Um, they got some safeties coming in, like Mark Perry from Colorado. Uh, Nuke Bradford's been around for a long time. I think they're going to be set up pretty well in the back end. But, um, you know, you you went down those rushing stats. I mean, everybody ran on them. And, it, like, it didn't matter if they were a physical team and, and that was their MO or not. Like, they just – they were getting five or six yards of rush, so they stayed on the ground as much as possible. And if you can't stop that, even in modern football, um, it's going to be a long day. So they have to find a way to shore that up. If, if that doesn't improve, then it's going to be a long season. What about um, some of the freshmen coming in? I mean, I know they got a few four stars coming in. I mean, are we going to see any of these guys? I know get a couple of receivers and then a Chase Biddle, a safety coming in as well. I mean, are we going to see any of these uh, new new kids in the block inserted or is it going to be a, kind of a lot of relying? Because, I mean, like they do return 14 starters. So, mm-hmm. you know, and you mentioned there's a lot, there's some depth at a lot of these positions of guys that we've heard before. But, I mean, transition always does leave opportunity for new guys to come in if certain guys struggle with that transition. Yeah, so, I mean, we talked about receivers earlier. These guys are not top on the depth chart, but I think they'll get some play just given how Sonny Dykes likes to mix and match um, receivers throughout the game. DJ Allen from Gladewater and then uh, Jordan Hudson from Garland, you know, both of those guys have been impressive. So that should be um, two players that you'll see at times on Saturdays. Chase Biddle is really athletic. He's from Garland as well, the safety. Uh, and then I think the guy that will probably get the most snaps is is the nose tackle I mentioned earlier, Dominic Williams. They fought off – he's from California. They fought off Cal to get him. And, um, you know, he's got that prototypical size for the big guy in the middle at 6'2", 325. And that's really nobody else on their roster is is made up to, to play that spot right now. So I feel like he'll get the most opportunities. I don't know if you'll see him in the stat sheet because of um, just kind of the nature of the beast playing there. But – uh, yeah, I think they'll see some of those freshmen, um, especially a lot of those offensive guys. They're going to want to spread the ball around as much as possible. So uh, Jordan Hudson has been really impressive in in fall camp, and I think he'll get some opportunities as the year goes on. Prediction for this team, Stephen. Uh, their schedule is – it's interesting. You got at Colorado, which I don't think we're expecting much from Colorado, but obviously you got a team in TCU. It's in transition, so we don't know what we're going to see. Uh, Tarleton at SMU in the Iron Skillet game, Oklahoma at KU, Oklahoma State, Kansas State. That's big. They get uh, they get OU, OK State, and Kansas State, three of the top five preseason teams at home. But then it does get tougher at WVU, Texas Tech, at Texas, at Baylor, back to back, and then Iowa State to finish with. So I guess the goal here we're gunning for six, right? I mean, you look at the schedule. You think Colorado, Tarleton, SMU. You know, you could see three and O there at Kansas. You got to pick that one up. Uh, it puts you at four, and then you just need two from Oklahoma State, Kansas State, at West Virginia, Texas Tech, at Texas, at Baylor, Iowa State. I mean, it's, it, you know, it's it's balanced schedule, I would say. Back end's a little bit, a little bit harder, but like overall, kind of balanced. You're not you're not hating all the games you have this year. So, do you see six? Are you there? Are you at five? Where, where are you? Official prediction for the season. I think they end up seven and five. I feel like getting through non-conference at three and zero will be huge. Um, And then you mentioned the KU game. Now, one thing about Sunny Dykes teams at SMU that was concerning—they would really fade down the stretch. Like they would be hot 
you know, get they get pull off a big upset win against a, a TCU early in the season, and then November would roll around, and they would kind of go through the teeth of that schedule in the American, and they didn't play well. And so um, I think that, you know, we'll see how that transitions when he's there at TCU, but I, I, that is something I'm watching this year. Um, you know, th- there's teams that I think they should be able to compete against on a normal season. They haven't played well against lately, like West Virginia and K-State. But as you said, you're traveling to West Virginia, um, and K-State is kind of a dark horse pick for the Big 12. So it'll be interesting to see where they're at. But if they can get to 4-0, and you know, I feel like going um, – three and five down the stretch is not unreasonable. So I, I, I think seven and five is where they end up. Um, they pull off an upset or two and get to a bowl game. Hopefully you win that. And I feel like that's a really successful season for Sonny Dykes in year one. Steven Simcox, where can people find you and your work and all of its variety? I'm at Simcox Steven on Twitter. The show is at Locked on TCU. Um, Locked on Horn Frogs is a podcast and we're on uh, YouTube as well. So yeah, YouTube or podcast platform however you'd like to enjoy it. That's where you can find me. Steven Simcox, Locked on Horn Frogs. Appreciate your time, man. Thank you so much. Thanks, Josh.